and welcome. It is my pleasure to uh, be joined uh, with Mike, the Executive Director of the Connecticut's Children's Museum. Uh, but my name is Jim Palma, and I'm going to get right into the topic uh, of what is the Connecticut's Children's Museum. And uh, I think you were telling me earlier, uh, a lot of people might have an idea what that name is, but when they say, oh, are you the one with the whale? Right. The answer is right. yes. yes. Yes, we're the one with the whale. Definitely. Um, to, to your point, Jim, most people are not aware of what a children's museum is about, in particular, what our um, uh, programs are all about. So let me just take a minute and talk about uh, what we do in general. Um, we are an educational entity, and that catches people a little bit by surprise. We're not an entertainment venue. We're, our, every program, every event, every action we take has to have a learning component in it. And we focus on pre-K through middle school age children. And the important thing about that genre and that um, uh, demographic is they learn by doing. Ah. It's the key to everything. They must be able to touch, maneuver, change, break. <laughs> you know, it's part of the game. Um, but everything we do has those dimensions to it. So you will find uh, we have two campuses. We have the campus in West Hartford where the whale is. Everybody's familiar with the whale. And we also have a Canton, um, Connecticut campus. It's the Roaring Brook Nature Center. So between the two of us, we make up the entirety of the organization. It's probably one of the larger organizations. It's certainly the largest children's museum in the state of Connecticut mm -hmm. when you put all those assets together. And it's one of the largest ones um, in New England. But it's, it's got a set of assets that makes it unique in, in the, almost in the United States, too. The programs really break into three categories, and okay. that, that's important. We have programs that we do inside the buildings that we have uh, or in the grounds around the building. Mm -hmm. So that's your typical situation where people buy a ticket, buy a membership, walk in the door. There are exhibits there, there are programs for families that are put on there, um, and, and that's a, a, a traditional part of our program. It's about a third of what we do of all of our activities, and every one of those activities, if you walk in there, you'll see uh, they're made to two scales. They're either made to that height or they're made to that height because that's the size of the population and it, they have to have to be able to uh, maneuver and get a hold of stuff. Sure. The other piece that we do is the educational agenda. Now, most people aren't aware, and it's a large part of our business, almost 30 to 40 percent of our business. We actually are probably the largest source of science and nature-based courses in the school systems, uh, elementary school systems mm -hmm. in the state. We go out to 300 schools. We have 150 different classes, all state meet state standards, national standards for science. Mm -hmm. um, we teach those in those elementary schools or preschools, either ones, or in libraries or any uh, learning sure. institute. Um, and those are actually a uh, satisfy the, the school's curriculum needs. Mm -hmm. The school will either bring the children to us and we will teach them in our classrooms or we will send our people out to their classrooms. So we have a large educational staff that goes from border to border, literally from New York into Rhode Island into Massachusetts and 300 to 350 different schools. Probably serviced about 50 to 55,000 children mm -hmm. in that regard last right. year. The third piece is the traditional piece that every not-for-profit has. You've got to raise money. Sure. Uh, but a big part of our grant programs, we have very active grant programs. A large part of those grant programs are uh, bringing in grants so we can service the underserved and the underprivileged. Okay. So we have an awful lot of grants, from, even from people like Walmart, national uh, sources like Walmart, local sources like banks or the insurance companies, uh, in which we will then take our courses into those school districts that cannot afford to do it or will provide buses so that they can come to us. So the three 
legs of the stool, if you would, yep. are the um, in-house activities, the educational outreach activities, mm -hmm. and then the grants to sort of uh, make all of that work. Sure. So you, you said something that, that piqued my curiosity. So if I were a school, or a teacher, probably okay. more likely, okay. am I worrying about, not, I shouldn't say worry, is my way of contact to the museum to say, you know, I have a class and I have a free period or a class trip and I want to schedule that, right. or is it more what I thought I heard you say, which was, you know, you have wonderful curriculums already established that might be able to be applied in the actual classroom, or is it a little of both? Help it's actually a mix that. of both. Yeah. Um, we all of our classes have to be tuned to whatever the state, uh, town, and national standards okay. are. So, uh, for example, we will we'll mail out a brochure at the beginning of every academic year. It'll list all the courses. It'll list what grades each course is appropriate for. It'll also list what the standard it's meeting okay. that because the school teacher has to know, okay, I have certain standards, I have to meet which one are you meeting. Mm -hmm. So that would be the, the sort of the off the shelf. But then a lot of times people will come to us and say, well, we want a mix of this, this, and this for special purposes, and then we'll, we'll custom. Uh, so you can tailor it to oh, yeah, the, sure, the actual school sure. or teacher. Yeah, yeah we, mm -hmm. I mean, we've been in this business for, the uh, museum's been there 90 years. We've been in the, the, uh, the museum business and the education business for almost mm -hmm. all of that period. Mm -hmm. So we have a, um, a very wide uh, footprint in terms of uh, people that uh, we deal with. We have enormous number of repeat customers because we satisfy mm -hmm. their needs. And it's really growing quite a bit. This is an interesting piece. Uh, within the last two or three years, we've found a lot of um, school districts have put in place what they call uh, out of school or after school or summer school programs. But within those, they want to put in what they call STEM enrichment courses. Oh, so really? STEM being science, technology, engineering, and um, math. Mm -hmm. um, because um, it really gets a little dry if the kids are always doing homework or always um, uh, doing play stuff. So they, they bring us in to, mm -hmm. to do STEM enhancement mm -hmm. programs. So we have an, a lot of after school and a lot of uh, summer school, mm -hmm. and and then that spills over into vacation periods. Okay. So it's a very active genre in, in which, you know, the kids get excited because they're learning something, but it's all, all done in a fun way. Um, we had one last year where we brought a, a bunch of girls in from um, Hartford for four-day course on, uh, these are all, uh, elementary school girls okay. for a four-day camp on forensics. On forensics? And they really? just had a ball. Yeah. They just had a ball. Mm -hmm. um, actually, Bill Pettit's uh, foundation funded it. Mm -hmm. and he, he's very much into girls in science, their, yep. their foundation is. And Bill came in and was working with the kids. It was really great. But the, the kids, um, then we brought in the police with the, the, the dogs and so that they get to, um, mm -hmm. but they get to do the stuff. And by the end of the week, they've actually solved a case, mm -hmm. you know, in, in that regard. So it's that kind of fun learning mm -hmm. um, that they go through. And it really, uh, mm -hmm. it's really interesting because then they write notes. <laughs> and and you, some of them are hilarious. Uh, you know, I, I never saw, met a frog before, I, you know, <laughs> things of that sort. Yeah. So it's, it's really uh, okay. enjoyable to watch the, the end game when Great. It, uh, they finish. So I'm going to go a little backwards. Okay. Uh, I, I was uh, mentioning, you know, in the beginning, you know, the Connecticut Children's Museum is a museum with the whale. Yes. But there seems to be some confusion from time to time with the Connecticut Science Museum, which does not have the whale. Right. But it, I mean, it, that's right. one way to keep them separate. But I'm sure there's a little bit more in terms of the who are you reaching right. out to, right. the purpose. And maybe if you could kind of give a, a broader explanation as to what is your audience versus theirs and how you might differ. Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, most people do are a little bit confused by that point. but. 
it's interesting if you if you look around the United States, you'll find every metropolitan major metropolitan area has both a science and a children's museum. Okay. So you go, okay, yeah. there's some empirical evidence that it's needed here. Um, and what happens is it, it's really about uh, different audience, different agenda, different assets, to, and, and the audiences. Um, essentially, a science center really tries to um, cater to all ages. It mm -hmm. does not. It, it, it covers the same age group, but it, it really needs to speak to all ages. Uh, we speak to the uh, preschool, and actually it's usually, some of them even speak to the one-year-olds, a little too young for us, but preschool to middle school. Okay. So, so we have definitely different, and the reason that's important is because um, that drives your agenda. If you're only dealing with um, the preschool to middle school, the elementary level, you really know they only learn by doing, and everything you do, they have to be able to touch, change, maneuver, manipulate. Whereas in a science center, you're more trying to teach um, technology and science, and it's not so much hands-on as witnessing what's going mm -hmm. on. So it's a little bit subtle difference, but it's a very important difference. Um, and uh, I mentioned to you earlier when we were chatting, that the one difference is we have to repair a lot of stuff. I mean, it's just the way it is, but it is. Yeah. And then the, the last piece is, okay, you have different assets. So our assets are uh, drastic, uh, any children's museum's assets are drastically different than a science center. Interesting. Yeah. Um, our assets are, they can be as simple as blocks, they can be as simple as, um, uh, you know, make-believe houses where, and make-believe kitchens and make-believe mm -hmm. uh, where kids can go in and do all that. We're, right now, we're putting, as we sit here, and I hope they finish by today. <laughs> They're putting a brand new dinosaur exhibit in. Ooh. Well, you, you know, kids can't not touch a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. They just love dinosaurs. But in our dinosaur exhibit, they've got to be able to touch and move everything. So it's a little different than if you go to a classic dinosaur exhibit where they're sort of displaying what's sure. going on. They're up on the wall or in, in the corner. Right. In ours, they're in there doing stuff with mm -hmm. the dinosaurs and the, the uh, um, all the assets that are in the room. So it's really, uh, I believe they're very complementary. Mm -hmm. um, I believe we, uh, people say, oh, don't you compete? No, we do not compete mm -hmm. because it's a different, you go there for a different reason than you go here is what it comes down to. So really, I, I think uh, we we are very comfortable coexisting and if you go to most towns, yeah. you'll find they always do. So right. um, it's, it's a, it's a, it's good to have the mix, to be mm -hmm. honest with you, is what okay. it comes down to. So I, I love the way you use the word asset, and uh, mm -hmm. it's interesting, but uh, maybe we can switch to switch the word to campus for a moment. Okay. Because okay. I know you have physically two okay. different sure. locations, right. one that's probably a little bit more in the know at the West Hartford campus, right. and, and the one, is, I don't want to say it's a good kept secret, but unless you've heard of the Roaring Brook uh, Nature Center or use it in the Farmington exactly. Valley exactly. or had, had right. reason to come and take advantage of it, it it's not as well known. If, 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 and, and maybe talk to us about you know, what is in each of the campuses. Well, actually, to your yeah. point, it's interesting. Here in the, in the Farmington Valley, people are aware of, of um, Roaring Brook Nature Center, cross Avon Mountain, <laughs> and all of a sudden, now it goes the opposite. People over here are less aware of us than uh, that campus. So let's take the two campuses. Sure. Um, the Roaring Brook campus is is really quite interesting and quite unique. So I'll spend a minute on that. Um, it's one of the premier nature centers. So it has uh, exhibits. It has um, um, outdoor areas in which the children come in and and they are led through uh, nature-based um, activities. Is what it comes down to. Um, and, um, for example, there's a butterfly garden. There's okay. a, a whole uh, trail system that they go on, and they can, uh, I think it's 160 acres of trails, wow. which have all these mm -hmm. different uh, science stations. But also Roaring Brook has um, a part of what's uh, our two-campus animal refuge. Now, people wonder, well, what is an animal refuge? Mm -hmm. 
we are in the business of um, uh, rescuing and rehabbing and, and if we can, um, uh, rehabilitating and putting um, animals back out in the wild. We only mm -hmm. deal with wildlife, we're not a zoo, mm -hmm. but we do an awful lot of repair work. So it's, we, if you go out to Roaring Brook, uh, you will find that they actually have um, a mini veterinary hospital in there where they are in the process, and any given, I think right now there's three raptors in there that are being worked on. Um, and if they, if we can't f find a home for them, mm -hmm. if we can't release them, a lot of times we can release, if we can't release them, then we'll actually f either harbor them ourselves and give them a permanent home or we'll uh, put them out in the wild. We have other animals, reptiles, amphibians as, as well. Now if you switch over to the West Hartford campus, there's a, a a branch of that refuge there as well. Mm -hmm. Between the two campuses, we have we house about 200 wildlife. Really? And we wow. actually um, uh, repair, um, uh, rehabilitate, or uh, rescue on the order of 200 a year. Mm -hmm. So it's a very big part of our program. Um, in West Hartford, you'll have. Uh, um, there's a lizard lair, there's a, a turtle town, there's a, um, a whole a collection of mammals mm -hmm. that, and a lot of those are um, confiscated animals or, uh, uh, for example, a lot of the animals uh, people will have as a pet are illegal and, and they'll be taken by uh, the government and then they have to uh, find a home for them, so okay. a lot of times we'll do that. The other assets in West Hartford, you have the planetarium. It's mm -hmm. one of the biggest in the state. I think it is the largest in Connecticut. Um, and you have uh, a, um, what am I thinking, a preschool. Yep. We also have a uh, about a seven or eight uh, different rooms of exhibits. All of the exhibits are um, new within the last year or two, and we are constantly reviving those and as I mentioned we're putting in the new dinosaur exhibit. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting one I'll tell you it's because it's um, you might get a kick out of this. What's that? It's um, Connecticut Jurassic Park. Uh -huh. So what happened uh, 200 million years ago or the back end of that period dinosaurs uh, did um, exist in Connecticut mm -hmm. and that's why Dinosaur uh, National Park exists mm -hmm. here. A dinosaur uh, park in Rocky Hill exists mm -hmm. here. What we've done is with a partnership of um, that park, Yale and Yukon, we've created a, a whole uh, exhibit that celebrates what the dinosaurs did here, mm -hmm. um, how long they lived here, um, and where they lived, um, and then the kids can interact with um, the stuff so they get to learn what a dinosaur is, how it works, uh, what its future is, and all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. And as you probably know, the th theory today is dinosaurs uh, really now are birds, <laughs> mm. or birds are dinosaurs, so they evolved in, in that regard. So that's a typical exhibit. Mm -hmm. There'll be other exhibits where uh, kids uh, do hands-on stuff as well. Um, we also have um, West Hartford uh, campus also houses a, uh, an outdoor area too. It has its own butterfly house that we open all summer long and uh, kids come in and release the butterflies and get to interact with them. We have uh, raised gardens where the kids get to uh, uh, compost plant um, seeds and then grow them and see how that works. So it's, it's a pretty comprehensive um, program and then the two together own this large education agenda. So the, the education staffs um, reside at both of those campuses, mm -hmm. and then they'll teach courses. Uh, they'll cross over a lot too. So they're intertwined. They're all you're intertwined. Yep. It's a yep. very integrated mm -hmm. dimension and program yep. is the way it works. Good. So I've had the pleasure of being in your planetarium okay. on a couple of occasions, and and each time, I mean, the idea of just sitting back and relaxing is first of all right. enjoyable, <laughs> uh, but to really take in, I think long before there was you know the the new oh yeah 
uh, IMAX theater experience, the planetarium was really the only place that you could get that. Uh, and then to really be able to go almost any place in the universe right. and see what it is or how it has changed. I mean, how, how do... How do people find out about it? Do you have an ongoing schedule? Is it something that groups can say, we would like to yeah, have okay. our group come and experience something special? Um, well, we yeah. actually use a planetarium. I think you told me earlier, we use it two ways. We use it mm -hmm. in the classical planetarium sense. And the important thing about planetariums is it's total immersion. So uh, it's what virtual reality is trying to get to. Mm -hmm. and. Um, the problem is you're isolated in virtual reality. And, and so the planetarium experience is quite unique, um, and I don't see it going away anytime soon. So that's I number one. Not, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, conceptually, people could say, why do we need planetariums anymore? We have virtual reality. It's a different experience. That's mm -hmm. number one. Number two, you can't see the night sky anymore. Light pollution is a problem. Mm -hmm. So just being able to experience what the sky is over you uh, in a planetarium turns out to be pretty significant. And then I think it's true to say sp space exploration is coming back into uh, of interest to the lay public. So it, it allows us then to um, do exploration anywhere in, in the solar system that mm -hmm. you can imagine. Now, the second point is we use it also uh, for meetings. And, and it's really quite interesting. The only problem you have is um, in the chairs you lay back, you gotta yeah. keep people's <laughs> eyes open. So you gotta, you gotta keep it going here you, if you, uh, you, you get people bored pretty quick. But uh, so we use it uh, with other community groups. Mm -hmm. uh, we're very happy to have community groups come in and um, uh, use it for their purposes. Mm -hmm. um, we really view ourselves, and, and you'll find this at Canton too, uh, those spaces or, or um, other groups are welcome to use our uh, meeting spaces, mm -hmm. and, and we allow groups to do that with us too. In addition, we then have programs mm -hmm. um, for adults. <clears throat> So, in fact, last year we ran one on family health. Okay. Um, again, it fits our whole agenda of, of children and family. Mm -hmm. uh, we have programs, uh, planetarium-based, uh, um, uh, solar-based, and, and uh, space-based programs for adults, too. We haven't been doing as much of that in the last couple of years, um, and, but I think that's coming back. I mm -hmm. think people got um, so much into IMAX and all that stuff, but um, we're, we're starting to see a resurgence of interest in this kind of experience. Mm -hmm. So we expect we'll see more of that. But we use it really as uh, a theater for uh, the full spectrum, mm -hmm. what, whatever it is, children, uh, space, uh, community space, whatever. So mm -hmm. it's um, it's a very useful, we've seen about 145 in uh, it's not hard to get get that many in there. I mean, it, especially with the two school buses and you fill it up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's pretty easy yeah, from that great. standpoint. So I, I'm just trying to get my, my arms around all the things that we've been talking about mm -hmm. here, which is quite a lot. So you have two campuses. Right. Um, you have exhibits that vary over time. Right. Um, you have a curriculum that is at least used in general, right, uh, right. I should say very specifically, uh, for as many as 300 different Not schools school. that not right. are just Connecticut, but also uh, the, but the states right. that are adjacent to Connecticut. Uh, and, and if that weren't enough, you have plans to change and move. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So why don't you yeah. tell us a little bit about that? Well, we, we really have to move. There's a, uh, you know, there's a couple things pressuring us. And we're talking moving. just about West Hartford moving, right? Right. Yeah. And uh, that yeah. campus, um, in fact, as we sit here right now, we're in the process of expanding the Roaring Brook one. Uh -huh. So the Roaring Brook campus will, is, um, we're in the uh, second stage of the fundraising. Hopefully by the end of this year, that will expand a little bit. Okay. So that one we will uh, finish off this year. Mm -hmm. But then going forward, the West Hartford campus is really, we've, 
I tell people we're pot bound. The problem is we, we are feeling a lot of pressure for growth. We've seen a lot of growth in the last year or two. We see a lot of pressure to grow even more and do more programs. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have to um, expand. And the property we're on has uh, several characteristics that are problematic. One, um, it's, uh, you can't expand in either direction. It's a, it's a confined space. Two, they're older buildings, and the maintenance is just killing us. Mm -hmm. It's 60 years old, like mm -hmm. we tell people, we're running out of duct tape. You can't hold this thing <laughs> up anymore. Um, but the other real problem with the, the existing facility is it's, it's not accessible. It was built in the 50s and 60s, mm -hmm. and uh, it's very hard for people with any sort of limitations to get around. And we have ways to do that, but it's not easy on them, and it's... And, and it's uh, uh, problematic, and then sure. finally our lease is up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's a good yeah, lease. A, <laughs> now our landlord's been very accommodating and and uh, working with us as we keep looking for a new place to go. Um, where we're targeted right now, uh, most people are probably aware. Um, Yukon has a campus in West Hartford on Trout Brook Drive. Uh, it's been there, uh, I think, like 30 or almost 40 years. Um, and they have decided they're closing that campus and going to move um, all of those um, programs downtown to their new campus Correct. downtown. Yep. And they will be vacating that property, um, I believe it's August of this year. Mm -hmm. What we've been doing for the last year and a half is looking at would part of that property be a good fit for us? Mm -hmm. And we've convinced ourselves and a lot of the people that support us that that's the ideal place to be. It, it will make it give us just enough room to expand as we need. It'll be easier for people to get in and get out. Mm -hmm. Parking will be uh, not a problem. Um, and it, it, it will get out of what's really a busy area right now into more of a, a park-like setting. It's mm -hmm. right next to St. Joseph's. Um, if the town takes the property, the bulk of it is um, wetlands, so that'll probably have to be turned into a park anyway. Mm -hmm. So our vision is to move our, both our preschool and our museum up onto that property. And, and yes, people ask this question, the whale is going up Troutbrook Drive with us. There's no doubt about that. Thank goodness for that, right? <laughs> we haven't figured out how to do that yet. We're, we're working on that part. But um, we, it's only a mile move, so it makes it uh, kind of good from that standpoint. Mm -hmm. And then what we had envisioned, and we've we've gotten a lot of people to sign a petition to support this, is that make where you have the ball fields now, make the rest of it into a park and let us reside in the park, pretty much like Central Park in New York. You have a museum, people get to use the, mm -hmm. the park and then get to use the facilities as well. Mm -hmm. So we're really pushing hard to, to convince the town. The town has not yet closed the, the purchase, so it's really, a little bit behind schedule, but we're pretty sure um, the town will finish that and, and UConn and the town will finish that deal sometime in the next couple of months. And then, then we need to, we just need to raise money now yep. <laughs> to build the place. But, right. but that hurdle is not as, as big as finding a place, the right place to be. Uh, because um, you, you have to, the way we service families and they visit multi times a week, uh, a week sometimes, mm -hmm. multi times a month, um, and it has to be easy for them to get in and get out. Sure. And we run programs into the evening, so you just got to be in a place that is convenient for people. So mm -hmm. that site just fits us perfect uh, mm -hmm. at this point. So. We just keep our fingers crossed <laughs> that, that this will close that way. And I think I heard you say this, but just to kind of uh, make sure I, I'm not missing something, um, I know you have a very active, long-standing preschool program as yes, part of the museum. Right, right. But I assume that that's moving as yeah, well. Right, and maybe you could right. talk a little bit about what that, how that was envisioned. Well, let me go back to, you know, people say, why do you have a preschool? And, well, even uh, better yeah, question, yeah. sure. And then um, then you say, okay, this is why we're going there. Basically, I mean, again, um, we we always look at, we are a learning institute. We're a teacher. Um, 
an education entity, and we've been in the preschool business for years and years and years. Mm -hmm. the, the value add of, uh, to our preschool, being with the museum, is those kids get to use the assets in the museum in really? their curriculum. Oh. So there's two dimensions to our preschool that's really, really important. The first one is we, we keep it small. Mm -hmm. So we are anywhere, I don't know that we'd ever allow us to go more than 40, 45 students. That would be max. We keep it, uh, we're not in volume production. We keep mm -hmm. the ratio of students to teacher very low so that there's, a, and, and it's all play-based play learning. But then in addition to that, they use the assets in the museum a couple times a week. So there's a, a real strong value add with the two being together. And uh, we will continue that. Uh, we have people uh, are very happy to have their child have that experience. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of hands-on learning, but uh, there's very few preschools have an animal refuge available to them. There's very few preschools have a planetarium uh, available to them or have the unique exhibits we have, which we can then mm -hmm. uh, produce programs in. So. Um, we find the preschool is really uh, fits our, our whole mission statement and it works really well for us. So it, it will definitely go up the road with us, there's no doubt about it. No so, doubt about yeah. it, good, good to hear. Yeah. <laughs> I, I'm also curious about the, the, a little bit more about the animal refuge. Oh, okay. So uh, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking out loud that if, you know, in my neighborhood, there is a wild animal. I'm as a as a dad, as a granddad, you know, get away. Right, right. So, uh, how does how does this for safety reasons we don't want kids to go? Oh, there's an animal that needs some help. I should bring it to the refuge or the museum. We don't want to have that message. But w maybe you could walk us through well, uh, how that actually transpires, or yeah, the, the animal or, ends yeah. up at, at, at you know being repaired, being rehabbed at, at, at the museum. Well, the most classic example is. Uh, um, a hawk will get uh, whacked by a car. Okay. And the people will then uh, bring them to us and say, can you fix this? Now, th that can be a squirrel, that can be a raptor, that can be a, uh, whatever, a coyote, whatever's running around in the woods. Mm -hmm. um, um, in fact, there was a, um, if you remember, maybe about a month and a half ago, there was a deer that fell through the uh, ice in Connecticut yes. River. That was us that pulled them out. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so we, we're brought in whenever there's that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. In those situations, there's uh, several options. One, you, you help the deer, get the deer out, and let the deer go. Um, if the hawk needs uh, surgery, which is not unusual, we, we have a whole, um, uh, network of veterinary um, uh, organizations that work with us and help us, but, and then we actually have the rehab area there. They, they reside in our um, uh, refuge center while they're, they're um, healing. Um, we then either release those back in the wild or we'll, um, if we cannot harbor them on ourselves mm -hmm. and provide a home, we'll um, then find a home for them. Mm -hmm. There, then, then there's the second way they show up. So Johnny got a snake, <laughs> and Johnny and the snake grew, and then Johnny went to college, and mom and dad are then looking at a snake going, what are you doing with this? What are we gonna do with it now? Right. So it's not unusual that we get an awful lot of animals like that, um, that show up, uh, they're perfectly legal, made perfect sense at the mm -hmm. time, but uh, situations change, so we'll try to help that situation out. Okay. The third one's a little more um, testy. Uh, what happens is uh, people will have animals that don't belong here um, and, and are, are actually illegal. Okay. And if they're discovered, um, they will then be taken by, usually DEP will take those. Um, uh, and they then look for what to do with them because if you have a boa constrictor, you're not gonna ship it all the way back to South America, right? Mm -hmm. So, you, so uh, in fact, the boa constrictor we have 
was found in a home in uh, New Britain. Wow. And that's why he's named Stanley, by the way, <laughs> just so you're aware. <laughs> and Stanley was found. Um, but that's not unusual. We'll, we'll harbor a lot of animals that mm -hmm. um, uh, were taken illegally um, or they've become a, a, um, a threat in, mm -hmm. to some degree. So, and, and in all of those cases, what we do is we, um, we are inspected constantly, mm -hmm. so we have to be very uh, careful and clear. We have strong protocols about how the animals are treated um, and what we can and can't do with them. But we try to then integrate those animals into our education programs so the children get to learn animal husbandry, mm -hmm. learn um, uh, how to uh, relate to the animals. It's really quite interesting, speaking about snakes, um, there's very few children that won't touch a snake. There's virtually no mother who will touch a snake. <laughs> so it's quite interesting because the child wants to touch the snake and the mother's going, wait a minute, yeah. especially grandma is saying, wait a minute, I've been around long enough, I don't need a snake. So it's, uh, but it, it really works. The, the kids come in, we actually, they help during feeding time. So the kids get to, uh, to uh, both at Roinbrook and, and at, um, the West Hartford campus, they get to participate in that. So they get to start to learn how to take care of animals and why to respect them mm -hmm. and then respect the environment they're in. So okay. that's okay. Uh, that's a pretty normal process. It's a big part of if you visit the two campuses, I would say 20, 30 percent of the real estate is taken up by the refuge. It's it's quite big. It's well, that quite is big. significant. Yeah. yeah. And, and it's yeah. probably the one of the largest um, uh, <coughs> wildlife refuge in, in uh, Connecticut for certain, mm -hmm. if not in uh, southern New England. So, wow. um, and it's a it's an important ingredient in our educational programs because mm -hmm. it really lets us we can take kids with um, learning disabilities or limitations. We can take kids with all kinds of uh, you know cultural limitations and. Uh, with an animal, you, you can get dialogue going. Mm -hmm. and, and so it's very useful in that regard as well. You mentioned you know, the diversity not only of the animals, but also culture and language mm -hmm. of our region. Um, and, and I was just wondering if, you, if maybe you could help, under, help explain you know, the hands-on approach. You, know, you made the, the image right, before right, of the right, height right. of each of the displays. But I'm imagining that the uh, someone who who speaks uh, a variety of languages, or maybe is limited in some right. language, uh, might enjoy these hands-on displays just the way uh, someone who who is it's not really in that language. Yeah, no, it's an interesting dimension. Um, if you uh, so we do programs that are focused on family learning. Now there's a, a, a so I'm, I'm going to circle back to your question sure. in a minute. Okay. Um, and the reason for that is if a child is learning with the parent uh, present and participating, then when they leave, it's reinforced by the parent. So it's we have a lot of um, uh, what we call family learn together mm -hmm. programs, and in those you will find. Um, language is not a problem. Um, the kids almost, children just by the nature of uh, school and their playmates uh, know enough English that they, they get it. Mm -hmm. And they are then translating for their adults. And, and so yeah. when it's hands on, it doesn't take much um, uh, verbalization um, they can do it and then work together and do things. So it's not a problem. We, in fact, we're right in the process now of um, uh, crafting a few programs that we're going to be taking into um, the Latino community where uh, English is a problem for the adults. They are the majority of, uh, of um, adults in the Latino community are not really um, that comfortable in English. They're more comfortable in Spanish. The children, of course, are going to schools, et cetera. So we're actually starting to craft programs, dual language programs, mm -hmm. so that we can engage the parents more. But in reality, the children, um, 
form the bridge. Mm -hmm. As long as it's hands-on, as long as it's hands-on, the children will uh, be able to explain what they're doing and um, interact with the instructors. So mm -hmm. it's it's really um, a, a critical p piece of that being a success, uh, especially if we're in these family learn together settings is what it comes down sure. to. So. You had mentioned earlier the, uh, uh, I don't want to say the structure of the family per se, but uh, the audience that tends to be attracted to the museum, obviously children is, right, is the main right. focus, but the children can't bring themselves to that, or, or the right. reason there's some adult teacher, parent, grandparent Always. saying, right. Here, here's, let, let me get bring you here, or there's right. something interesting to say. So. Um, Maybe you could tell us a, a little bit about those differences, uh, the adult interaction uh, with the Well, with it's children. interesting. Um, so you have the classic school uh, field trip. Mm -hmm. And so um, the, the school bus will show up, you'll have two or three teachers with them, and then we have a, a certain ratio, since we're a certified um, entity, we have a certain ratio of our staff to their staff, and so that they're they're all surrounded by adults, mm -hmm. um, but uh, given a lot of freedom. But when you have the the walk through the door, customer um, sure. and client, um, they come in in three sizes. <laughs> they come in child size, parent size, grandparent size, mm -hmm. and it's not unusual, especially like over the holidays. Um, um, you will see three generations in there um, on a consistent basis and sometimes four generations at the same time mm -hmm. in there because they'll, uh, it'll be, um, you know, the, over the Christmas and Hanukkah period, uh, grandkids visit mm -hmm. and it's an ideal place for them to go and so you'll, you'll see all of them there and all of them interacting. Mm -hmm. We then have... Um, um, parents and grandparents and caregivers who will bring their child in two or three times a week, and and that uh, and, and this is quite interesting because um, little ones learn um, what they want to learn when they want to learn it, and so they'll they'll go into a space, and it, it, I think I mentioned to you before it's like watching the kids. And over the holidays, when they pull the toy out and play with the box instead of the toy, right? Because <laughs> they, they they're they're imagining something different. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the stuff that we have is built just for that purpose. Mm -hmm. It's nothing but a bunch of stuff to put together. And so they'll bring them in and uh, it's not unusual to see one child do the same thing for a half an hour, 45 minutes, mm -hmm. and then come back three days later and do it again. Mm -hmm. But eventually they get what they want out of it and then they, okay, now they'll move on to yeah. the next thing. And the, uh, the, the parents and caregivers and, and grandparents know that that child is uh, perfectly content mm -hmm. sitting there doing that stuff mm -hmm. over and over again. If, if you give children just license to do what you want with that stuff, mm -hmm they will do it yeah. and and it's it's interesting because i'll sometimes sneak into the room and just pretend like i'm doing something over in court because i'm just trying to watch how this takes place and um it's really interesting to see how they create in their own minds mm -hmm. some imaginary thing that's going on mm -hmm. and those blocks is a, they, they're actually a car yeah. <laughs> in their minds yeah. that's a car yeah. <laughs> it looks like a pile to you but it's a car yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So that, that raises an interesting question for me. Um, how do you go about choosing what exhibits to have, mm, yeah. how long you have them? I mean, do you actually have a, a little test group of, of children that try things out, or, or is it a little more uh, um, involved in, in an... Well, it's, it's like any uh, product development. You, you go with, you have people that have a lot of experience. Okay. So you start with staff that's been around and doing this for many, many years. Um, but then you have to design it. And um, and sometimes it just uh, I, it doesn't work. I, right now, there's one exhibit in there that has just been a total failure. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. There's one that and we can't. <laughs> Uh, maintaining it's impossible. Kids get bored with it quick, even though it's hands-on. Um, and and so that was a, a really well thought out, well planned. Mm -hmm. Didn't work. Um, then others, um, 
uh, and a lot of in the children's museums arena, uh, people market the children's museums uh, that have things, sure. and, and other museums buy them. Mm -hmm. So you can you can go. Uh, there's an association for children's museums. Really, and they meet mm -hmm. on a regular basis. So there's a whole, uh, actually worldwide, but um, uh, U.S. wide community for sharing information on mm -hmm. stuff. So um, it's not like you're you're isolated and out there on your own. You can learn from that. Mm -hmm. But when you put together a major exhibit. Um, you, a lot of times uh, they're traveling exhibits, so somebody else has already used them, and okay. they come with, mm -hmm. with the credentials and the um, legacy of that. Mm -hmm. And usually those are successful, or you don't take them. Yeah. Uh, but then when you design your own, you're at risk. And um, and we've had, you know, like anybody, you do it and go, well, that didn't work. Let's see if we can tune it up and mm -hmm. things of that sort. Mm -hmm. We've got our fingers crossed for that. We've put a ton of. We've been almost. A year and a half designing the Dino exhibit, and that opens Saturday. So is that a homegrown exhibit? We designed it yeah. with. Uh, we brought in um, Yale, UConn. Uh, That's right. You did Yale, like UConn, yeah. and um, Dinosaur um, Park. But mm -hmm. then we brought in a very well-known designer from uh, New York, mm -hmm. um, a, a manufacturing and design house from Massachusetts, um, but. You know, you never know. <laughs> You're going to put it out there and see. So as as we sit here, they're back there putting that thing together yeah. to get it open Saturday. So, um, But there's an example. We, we probably will, as we go forward, we'll have to tune it, change it. Yeah. We'll watch what works and what doesn't work. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a... It's a risky proposition, but it's it's controlled risk. Yeah. It's it's uh, um, at least I hope so. <laughs> They're not. Ex it, it may surprise people. You can you can easily spend several hundred thousand dollars on an exhibit. That's not unusual. These are not ten and twenty thousand dollar events. Mm -hmm. I mean, the time you put in all the design and manufacturing. You, you can be well over $100,000. Right. Mm -hmm. And is there a standard duration for an exhibit? Or do you, they, the more popular ones get a little longer stay, or they re-up, or how does that work? Um, so if you, um, if, so there's the permanent exhibits and the traveling exhibits. Okay. Typically, a traveling exhibit, you would, uh, you, you're essentially renting an exhibit. Mm -hmm. So you would rent it for six months to a year. Mm -hmm. uh, and you try to have something like that rotating through your organization just because you want a refreshment going on. Sure. People um, uh, are always looking for something new. By the way, kids are not. Adults are. The kids, they're perfectly happy to go see the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, they age out. I mean, you have to realize that uh, as kids become uh, teenagers, uh, they have totally different interests. So, sure. so that falls off. Yeah. But to get back to your point, um, we probably, um, after a year, maybe two, mm -hmm. if you're not refreshing that exhibit, mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you're repairing it on a constant basis. Mm -hmm. I mean, with, when, when you have hands on, it, that is um, a daily, weekly thing that you have to do. But um, over a period of time, it starts to get to where, okay, we need to add a little new uh, dimension to things. So we will probably, uh, so what do we do? Last year we put in um, three new exhibits, and the dino's the fourth new exhibit. Um, so probably within a year, one of those exhibits we'll probably uh, look for a way to move it out and put something in. But um, a children's museum's different in that the kids themselves will decide whether they want to use it or not. And it's 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 like the animal refuge. It's it stays the same, but the kids change. Yeah. <laughs> so right. it's not a problem. It's mm -hmm. it's a they age out and then you you catch the next cohort. Mm -hmm. So it isn't like. And, and that's a problem somebody like a science center has. It's, it's dealing with the same group of people um, over and over again. And so they have to constantly refresh and change stuff. In our case, it's, it's the customer changes. Mm -hmm. they, grow, they age out and we get yeah. the next cohort. So it's, it's a little different dimension in, in that regard. But 
things age and concepts age, so you have to worry about that. So, sure. Yeah. yeah. So I wanted to go back to um, the, the uh, Roaring Brook uh, campus for mm -hmm. a couple minutes. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. I, I believe that there's outdoor winter activities mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that are well known, well regarded. If, if maybe you could talk a couple minutes because we spent spent a lot of time right, on right. what's happening in West Hartford and the move and so forth. But uh, I didn't want to leave, uh, you know, the Canton facility uh, without right. maybe re yeah, Canton, circling back to that. Uh, Canton uh, has a lot of outdoor activities all year long. In fact, you'll there's programs that go um, no matter how deep the snow is. So they um, they will have, and, and in fact, that's important because they then study, well, what happens to the habitat? What happens to the animals? How do they survive? Um, so they will have um, almost uh, 12 months a year, they will have programs inside, mm -hmm. but always programs outside. Always so, outside. Oh, yeah, there's something going on outside all the time. They also go out to the schools, by the way, mm -hmm. uh, or the schools make field trips there. But in a lot of those field trips, it's out in, in the, the garden area or in the trail area or in the raptor area. Mm -hmm. There's a They have a whole raptor center out there. Mm -hmm. So a large part of their programs will first maybe start out inside in the, in the rooms, in the classrooms, and uh, the, there are animals in there as well, um, animals that have been rescued, and they'll have programs relative to those. But then there will be outdoor programs always. Um, and, and they're very popular. I mean, the, the uh, kids are all bundled up like, you know, uh, <laughs> but they, they love it. They get outside and, uh, you know, Weather doesn't bother children as much as it does us. <laughs> they, they have no problem with it. So it, it goes on on a regular basis, and they're very popular. They're very popular from that standpoint. Uh, I'm curious, are, are there special programs for the adults being outside, um, or, or is it really? Well, Roaring Brook has uh, more adult programs than um, Trout Brook, as a matter of fact. Okay. Um, Roaring Brook has a lot of programs, especially educating adults about animals, mm -hmm. animal care, animal husbandry. So they will actually, um, uh, and, and all this is on the website for people that are interested, but they actually have courses on how to take care of animals and, and uh, wildlife and, and things of that sort. So they have um, a pretty uh, robust curriculum in that regard. Um, they also have, they, they use their space for uh, semi-social uh, purposes mm -hmm. too. So they'll, they'll have uh, adult um, um, gatherings that, you, that use their common space. Um, so, uh, you know, they're, they're very entwined with the community around mm -hmm. them. And that's very typical of children's museums. They're not, they're not a, um, what they call a destination site where you, you go in, do your thing, and go out. The people develop a relationship with mm -hmm. them. Um, uh, our, our parents, um, we get to know them very well uh, as individuals. We get to know the kids very well as individuals. Um, and that's uh, uh, true both at Roaring Brook and at Trout Brook. But, but Roaring Brook is, is very much a, you know, that's, that setting out there mm -hmm. is such a beautiful natural setting mm -hmm. and it's a great draw for um, yeah. people in that area to, okay. to go there. So final question, what are you looking forward to most in this year? This year, well, first of all, let's define this year. So let's say 2017. Sure. Resolving uh, where we're going. I mean, well, I'm, I'm, let me back that up. Um, we really want to get the Roaring Brook uh, expansion done this year. We really would like to have that done. It's, it's, a, it's going to add a lot of value, more space, and, and so that's number one. Number two, then, is we resolve the issue of where we're going. Mm -hmm. So those two are probably our, our uh, biggest goals for the, the uh, 2017 is what okay. it comes down to. So. Sounds wonderful. Okay. Well, I wanted to thank you. Uh, I've learned a lot. I, hopefully our, our viewers have learned a lot. Uh, again, Mike, uh, executive director with the Connecticut 
Children's, Children's Museum, Museum right, right. the one with the whale, right. uh, in both Canton and in West Hartford. Uh, there's just a tremendous amount of opportunity. Uh, new things are coming right. at both campuses, and it's been an absolute pleasure to chat with you tonight. Oh, so it's been thank mine. you again. Thank you very Absolutely. much. Absolutely. Right All right. Grandmother. I remember coming here with my school group. We go to the museum almost every week. The museum began in 1927. It's a place where our parents can bring their children, let them be themselves, let them learn in a way that is comfortable at a pace for them. You have a child that can come here and get the best of almost all worlds when it comes to learning, mm -hmm. exploration. It's just a space where they can be creative. It gives you that connection with your child. It was very exciting for her to be able to bring her grandkids here when we were little, and I was able to bring her here with her great grandkids. It caters to children. It's an interactive place. It allows even the adults to be children. Our community definitely benefits in so many ways by having the museum here in our town. A move to a new location would open up the resources to allow us to bring new themes, new disciplines to uh, our, our community, our families, and our children. I mean, one of the things that engages the kids, I think, is its proximity. Children grow up with this. This is such a great resource to have. It's It just blows my mind. It's a landmark. This has been here for so long. I mean, it belongs here. 